Good morning, this is Patrick D. McCoy, and welcome to Across the Arts from this exciting installment of The Maestro Series. Today, we welcome back to The Maestro Series conductor, Marlon Daniel. Good morning, Marlon. Ah, oh, good morning, Patrick. <laughs> it's early. It is, good morning. Yeah. Welcome back to The Maestro Series. It's so nice to be back, you know. I, I always have a great time here and you're such a wonderful host, you, you're you infectious. Oh my goodness, I appreciate it. You know, so the very first time we chatted on the Maestro Series, of course, was back in 2012 as, and you were doing great things then, especially with, in, uh, with um, Ensemble Dumont. But talk, let's go back 
well, not actually back. Let's speak currently. How have you adapted to social distancing right now when many people have been out of, you know, performing engagements and so forth? Well, um, there's been a lot going on in my life, which touches my life, you know, um, during this period with uh, the COVID and things like that. And um, uh, many of my close friends know that I lost my mother to COVID. And, um, and my father followed her um, a few weeks later. So I've been dealing with the double these days. And so it's really affected my life personally. Um, as far as um, musically or educational wise, um, I just started a new job. Um, I'm now the director of ensembles, orchestra ensembles at um, Fordham University. Congratulations. And so now I have to deal with social distancing and COVID and everything in one fell swoop. I mean, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So let's go back. First of all, again, just, you know, congratulations on the Fordham appointment. I mean, that is wonderful. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I want to backtrack because I know that you're a native of Chicago. And um, talk about Chicago and just growing up and how did you catch the musical bug? Um, well, Chicago, of course, I'm born and raised, born and raised in Chicago. Um, I think the Illinois and Chicago are known for their artistic people, you know, Damari McGill and, uh, and uh, of course, um, they all are, all these people in Jan Janae Brueger, we're all Chicago people. And I believe Nicole Heaston Lane and uh, a bunch of other people are Chicago people and we're all on the scene. And so it's kind of, I don't know if it's in the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, last year, my first time being in Chicago was last summer for the NAM convention. And it was so amazing, you know, to be there and, and see where the Chicago Symphony performs and the Grand Park Music Festival. So it was such a great time being there. Now, I'm sure there may be some aspiring conductors who may be watching. Uh, and I and I, of course, know that you went to the Manhattan School what was that educational experience there? I mean, that's one of the top musical schools on the planet. Well, yeah, uh, Manhattan School was was very good. I mean, they, you know, I was very happy to be there and I, you know, did a lot of work there. I started my conducting career at the end of days there because I wanted to actually conduct for my last concert there. I wanted to conduct a key, uh, piano concerto from the keyboard, just like mm. Mozart. So that's how I started. And I gathered all my friends from the Pinker Zuckerman studio and all, and I had, was very popular. I say, well, would you guys help me? They all jumped on board. We did a concert. It was so good. Afterwards, they said, our hero, what's next? <laughs> and I had no idea what was next. As a matter of fact, I actually learned all the things from about conducting that piano concerto from watching Daniel Barenboim videos. So technically, I guess he was my first real teacher. Wow. <laughs> But, and I didn't have to pay him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because now during this whole season with COVID-19, there's a lot of opportunities that people normally would have to pay for all of these panels and master classes. Yeah. They're getting it during this time. So that's interesting that you mentioned that. Now, I know that everybody is on for the topic of the hour. So I want to get right to it. I want to talk about or maybe ask the question, who was Chevalier de St. George's and why all of the buzz around this composer right now? Can you maybe open this up for discussion right now? Who was Chevalier de St. George's? Because you know, there's a lot of uh, buzz around his name and we're so excited for that reason. Talk about him. Well, Chevalier de St. George was a French composer. Um, he was from Guadeloupe, which mm. is the islands. He was well, you know, born in Guadeloupe and uh, went on to France to study and uh, and become famous. He is actually, you know, cited as at least the, the first black composer. And the funny thing about San George is they always talk about appropriation and things like that, is he actually influenced Mozart, Haydn, and even authors like Alexander Dumas. And then for some reason he was just lost, or uh, some people like to say stricken from the history books, but mm. he was the most important composer at that time in France and, uh, you know, Mozart actually went to uh, France. As everybody knows, he wrote his Paris Symphony. He went to France to be a star. 
Well, when he got there, there was already a star there. <laughs> this guy couldn't find a job, and the star happened to be a person of color. Mm. And, uh, you know, and they they've gone on to say, you know, and Mozart was there 1778. He was there earlier, like in 1773, when he was a child, and he thought, I'm gonna go back to where I, you know, and show them. He wasn't showing pretty much anything. He tried to adopt the style of the music of that time, which was predominantly Saint George. Saint George was was very prolific and uh, just in music, but just as a person, extraordinary. He was the best fencer uh, in Europe, probably in the world at that time. Um, our president, John Adams, said that he was the most accomplished person in Europe. But for us, he was like a Superman. He was like the jack of all trades and master of them all. He could dance, mm. he could play the keyboard, he was a conductor, he was a boxer, he was a marksman, he was an equestrian. I'm like, what couldn't this <laughs> man do? And you think that, you know, how many historical movies are being made these days and things like that. And, and you know, history books that they should really focus in on somebody who was so accomplished. I mean, it's just, I mean, he was great inspiration for me. And what I learned about him, I learned about him like during, you know, my first or second year doing college. I had never heard about anybody whatsoever like this because, you know, I always thought classical music was, you know, People tell me that's white. I loved it for the sense of it, but to find out this rich history of people of color in classical music, it just was a revelation. I could not believe it. And that's what drew me to actually doing his music and researching his life and bringing it to other people. Now, one of these days, you're going to be in the history books, Marlon, because um, from what I see and what I know, you are one of the um, preeminent specialists in his music. How did that come about where you really just knew um, that people would come to you as far as advice and things like that on the music of Chevalier de St. George? Um, I never thought of myself as a specialist, and I actually don't think of myself as a specialist. I think of myself as more of a person who's done the work. Uh. I discovered St. George and I did his work. I programmed him for the last 20 years and researched his life. And, um, and in, in some ways, it, the payoff is that I am now the artistic director of the Festival International of the Music St. George in Guadeloupe, the birthplace of St. George. And this is supported by the French government and of course the uh, Guadeloupe, you know, Conseil de Regional. Guadalupe tourism. And I mean, Guadalupe has never forgotten St. George because I mean, it's their people, but even if the world has. And so when the opportunity came about for me to found this festival and to give something back and to really on a really large scale, um, you know, bring St. George to the world, I, I of course did it. Talk more about the festival, because I know I saw a lot of um, attention drawn to it. Talk about the festival, the most recent festival that you had, and you had all those world-class artists of color on the roster. <laughs> well, I, I decided if I was going to do this, I was going to do this the right way. And um, I have a long list, <laughs> a long list of close friends who I've worked with, who I went to school with. And I said, you know, let's honor St. George and this festival with, you know, the, 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 what, the, what the people it deserves. So I called, first person I was calling, I called my good friend, Janae Bridges. Everybody knows her these days. I called Solomon Howard. I called Kogabra Kameda. I called, you know, and all these people, and they came a running for me. You know, when you're a startup and you don't, first of all, they would like to see how you're gonna do. So they don't give, throw the, the whole baby in the bath water at you. They give you a startup. <laughs> so, but they came unreserved mm -hmm. came to to do this because they saw that the value in this and to how to bring diversity to classical music in a really great way not by just talking about it but by doing it mm. now this festival is considered one of the most prestigious if not the the most prestigious festival classical music festival in the caribbean and you've been recognized yourself for that can you maybe talk about some of the awards associated with the festival well yeah i well you know it it, it is it is it's like over a very short period of time um once i started off the way i started off with all the biggest artists that i could find of color 
it was it was sort of inevitable. And the scope of it, it takes place for like a whole week in Guadalupe, normally right after Easter. Um, this next time it's gonna be April 10th through 17. Instantly attracted people. And uh, because it does have these great artists, it has a full orchestra, festival orchestra of St. George. And, um, and great ensembles coming, parallel brass, um, which, you know, includes people like Burt Mason and, um, and, and, you know, these people came all together. And so it was really, really something special in the making. Um, the OECS, which is like the organization for the unification of all the Caribbean islands, we became one of their spokes. We were like, you know, we're representative. We gave a concert that, you know, all of the the leaders of all of the islands were there and signing this whole big treaty of, of unification. And we were, of course, the orchestra and I was the conductor for that. So that was really quite special. So that's how it happened. It was just one thing after another and there's still more to come. Wow, you know, um, I wanna kind of back up a little bit because as you know, there's a lot of things going on. We talked about social distancing, COVID-19 and so forth, but also this, this um, piece of diversity and inclusion uh, during this time. And you know that, you know, the spotlight has definitely been put on artists of color, but as it pertains to conductors, you know, I think, I'm, well, I would say I'm very happy to see that a lot of our black conductors are coming truly to the forefront, but you've been on this journey for a while because I've been just reviewing all of your accomplishments and all of the international orchestras that you have um, conducted and, and so forth. Could you maybe talk about the reception of yourself as a black conductor when you walk into the European setting of, of uh, an orchestra? Well, uh, in Europe, uh, I've always been really well received. Mm. Um, I even like in as far as Russia is concerned, um, um, I premiered the William Grant Still Afro-American Symphony in Russia. And uh, in the, the William Grant Still Foundation and his daughter Judith Still have applauded that they they figure me like a champion of William Grant Still's music, but I feel that I'm only doing not not, not so much my job, but bringing a light to these composers. Mm -hmm. uh, every concert you see, they have a new work on the program. They do all these things, and it's very seldom you have a work by a composer of African descent. Um, George Walker was a big mentor of mine. He mm -hmm. every single last one of his pieces of mine. But every year you see in February, they always put the lyric, which he really kind of not despised. He was happy that they were playing something, but they always said that basically his music is too difficult, but then they turn around and do a piece by Ligeti or, mm -hmm. or some, something or Stravinsky, which is just as difficult. But so you have to, when I would program, I would always program a work, you know, I would try to a work by a woman composer, a living composer, a work by a living black composer. And I would suggest when we do a concerto, if it's a violin soloist, I would say, hey, let's, instead of doing that Mozart concerto, because there's only one of them, uh, let's, you have a 14, selection of 14 concertos by St. George, pick one of them, do it, <laughs> or I can suggest one. And that way, you know, little by little, I think by this effort, little effort by presenters and conductors, um, sooner or later, people will start to catch on that, hey, there's more out there than Mozart. And I love Mozart. Don't get me wrong. I think he's a supreme genius. But if they have the choice, I mean, the St. George repertoire would be in the repertoire, for at least for violinists, because he was just a virtual violinist. It will be there. If Just think if every conservatory said, uh, you know, they always say a classical requirement, a concerto of Mozart, Beethoven, and they just put two words. And Saint George or Saint George, more people would actually do it. Well, you know, I had a, a moment of nostalgia because when you mentioned the late George Walker, I remember a few years ago the National Symphony Orchestra they they have this um, music in your neighborhoods program, and they featured George Walker. And if I'm not mistaken, they did do the lyric, but it was they did a, a larger work also. And it was an honor to meet him. I think that's probably one of the last times that he was here in Washington. So that, that made me smile when you mentioned him. George now, I want, now I want to go back and talk a little bit 
about just historic conductor figures because a few weeks ago I had the opportunity to talk to Rufus Jones and talk about Dean Dixon. Could you maybe talk about these these historic uh, black conductor figures or even other figures that have really just been ingrained in what you do? Well, first of all, Dean Dixon is my hero. Mm. I, I, I am always saddened by Dean Dixon because he was very prolific in Europe and especially in Northern Europe. And, um, and Rufus has so eloquently written about him in his book. Uh, shout out to Rufus. Um, because I think that it w if that was somebody that was our biggest figure in classical music for conductors. And had he been allowed to practice his craft with freedom in America, it would have been a historical moment for us. Everything would have changed. It's changing moments like that. And I have a special place for Dean Dixon because um, many people know if they read my resume or things like that. I studied uh, with Yorma Panola, the maker of maestros who's in Finland, who taught Susanna Malki, Esa Pekka Salonen, Autumn Vanska, every Finnish conductor that comes out swinging and have jobs these days. Um, I am um, under the mentorship of this man. And he told me when I first met him, before he took me on, he asked me out of the blue, he says, um, you know, do you know Dean Dixon? Mm. And I said, well, of course I know Dean Dixon. You know, is my, is my skin brown? Do I know Dean Dixon? And he says, and I said, of course. I said, he's been a hero and an idol of mine and, um, and his struggle and everything about him you know, I, I've idolized. And then you know what he told me? He mm. said, Dean Dixon was my teacher. Wow, my goodness. Oh, I was like, oh my God. And I thought about that a lot. I just thought, you know, if Dean Dixon was, was, was alive, was allowed to live in America and be the conductor, probably the director of the New York Philharmonic or something like that, been at Juilliard, he would have started a legacy of black conductors and just conductors, period, that Yoma Panola has done for for the for, the, for Finland, it was just, it just blew my mind that indirectly or well kind of directly that I had been influenced by Dean Dixon and didn't even know him, didn't even know it was possible around like halfway around the world, you know, and that is something that I will never forget and always cherish. Wow, I I, I just think about all of these brilliant conductors who are coming up now, like, of course, you, I'm so honored you're back on the Maestro series and, you know, Roger Cox and the list goes on and on. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is just a question that just, just coming to me and I hope you will entertain it. Um, what do you think it's gonna take to really bring our black star conductors right now into the real prominence at, you know, maybe at the helm of a, a major orchestra? I know well, that's a, a question. Yeah. Well, a lot of uh, black conductors are hitting it hard these days. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, you, to grow, you need opportunity. Mm. A really wise friend of mine told me that you need opportunity to grow. And um, these days, I think that we're the closest we've ever been, um, you know, closer than James DePriest, you know, closer than a lot of people to doing that. I mean, you mentioned, you know, my friend Roderick. Uh, mm -hmm. There's other people, Wilkins and uh, a couple of younger conductors that are really hitting it hard. I try to hit it as hard as possible because I think we are so close to ringing the bell. We need a black conductor to be in the helm of a major, at least major American symphony. Mm -hmm. you know, because we, you know, the, the fallacy before is with orchestra instruments is that we don't exist. You know, we don't exist. And so when they're looking for somebody, we couldn't find anybody. Um, <laughs> Terrible. And it's, we do. And we have lots of people like in the field of violin and cello, Sterling Elliott, come mm -hmm. on. He's fantastic. Um, and, um, and people, you know, but since, you know, Marion Anderson broke open the door on that, she did what she could. Um, women of color have always been since then recognized for the, of course, their beauty and their 
you know, beautifully big voices and people around the world since Barrett Anderson has been emulating that. I think, you know, a theory of mine is that that these singers who of color have changed the voices of opera. They didn't used to sing like that until Marian Anderson uh, did mm -hmm. that. And um, basically it's been like always acceptable to have a black woman. You know, I mean, she's exotic and, um, and let's not even go into the fact of like system racism and things like the hot and top Venus and all those things that were negative and positive all at the same time. But to have a woman would be wonderful to have this heroine be at the center of it, like Aida and things like that. But once you put a, you know, a black man in a romantic scene, now that still to this day, it's been, it's just, it's, uh, you know, not well frowned upon, I guess, uh, might be a term, but you know, even Paul Robinson and all these people have not been able to overcome that because then it's not acceptable. You know, black men are considered, I don't know, they think they're threatening or things like that. And, um, but nowadays we have people playing classical music really on violin on the highest level, cello, mm -hmm. high level, instruments that are not synonymous with blackness or that they think that are not synonymous. And the forefront of that and the most dangerous person, I guess in this mentality is the black conductor because this is an instant role reversal. If you're in an orchestra and you're a black conductor, the, the majority, if not all of the people in the orchestra are white. Now that mm -hmm. is something that, you know, from plantation days and things like that in slavery, there's the white person who is the head of the plantation. Mm -hmm. Now you have the, if you have a black person in that position, that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable. But you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because it harkened me back uh, <clears throat> to my childhood and I, and I hope I don't get myself in trouble. I remember when I was a teenager and I sang in our local choral society and the choral society was mostly a white choir mm -hmm. and the conductor was a black conductor over this majority white choir. Mm -hmm. So now that you mentioned this in relation to the orchestra, now I look back at that experience and I kind of, you know, harken back, you know, to some of the, the interactions that I kind of saw that I really didn't pay attention to mm -hmm. until you mentioned this dynamic. So that that's amazing. But I want to go back to this whole idea of diversity because you've definitely been, you know, active um, speaking on topics of diversity at prominent universities. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that for the listeners? Well, one of my platforms that I talk about, at, you know, that I talk about at Yale and Columbia is basically the arts and social change. That's mm -hmm. one of my big platforms because I think it's relevant. You know, we, on a short term and, and long term, we need to see people of color in very many things that people don't associate with us. For instance, classical music, there's still a glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of outreach and I did some outreach for the Diversity in Classical Music Project at Columbia University and other places in the Bahamas. I did a, a, a presentation on St. George in the Bahamas and 400 children showed up. 400 children, you know, and were silent. They were just amazed at what I was telling them and the music that was being played. And on one of these ex engagement projects, a little girl came to me afterwards and she, you know, she wasn't a musician at all. She says, I never knew that there was a such thing as a black conductor. And now mm. I, feel you, I feel like I can do anything. Wow. The rest of my life. It's one of the most encouraging things I've ever heard. That is powerful. I And, you know, I think about, you know, my hometown and our conductor. Shout out to Ulysses Kirksey. We have the Petersburg Symphony there. And so it's always amazing to, to hear different stories and how they connect with you. So I want to move ahead and I hope that the listeners and the audience have some questions because I would love to entertain some questions uh, if there are some, if you would write them in the, in the live chat box. But I want to move ahead a little bit and ask um, I know that we talked about COVID and how it's affected us right now at this present time, but I'm sure you may have some things on the horizon. What's up next for you? Well, wow, a lot of things are for me, next for me. Um, the festival is planning uh, musicians and the uh, orchestra and Ensemble du Monde because they're the ensemble and residents are playing and, and the artists are planning a tour 
we have a tour on the table which we're offering to orchestras of you know a concert i call um you know not to be a s sort of facetious but mozart in black and white but oh. I, <laughs> that's nice yeah and uh we're basically offering you know a program of mozart and uh, saint george or i should say saint george and mozart and then yeah. and and other composers that have been influenced because everyone says that you of course Mozart influenced like Prokofiev, so we'll do like the classical symphony. But the thing is, and who influenced Mozart, you see? So I'm going from the source all the way up. And uh, and really what I'm very, very proud of besides, you know, premiering the complete Anonymous Lover um, opera, the only complete opera of saint George, I did the premiere of that. Um, I've been working diligently on a new version and a concert version that we will present with this program and um, have some wonderful artists mm -hmm. that I've been talking to about doing it. One of your favorite, uh, Stephen Salters. Yeah, yes. get him on that. And uh, you know, and Noah Stewart, I've been talking to him and um, and this new concert version, uh, you know, I've been mentioning it to Janae and Leila Bredon, this wonderful Guadalupean soprano, Leila Bredon. And, uh, and trying to bring it all together and just, you know, offer a selection of, you know, with the opera, perhaps one of his concertos with the, you know, hopefully a um, a violinist, one of these fabulous violinists of color who are out there, you know, and uh, and offer this program to orchestras. It's like instant recognition. You can get that, you can get a little bit of history, a lot of education, and you can show that basically we are here. We've always been here and, um, you know, the, the, it should be recognized. Wow. So with the festival, I think I, I and, and I'm just I'm just asking this because, I, you know, I, I like to be very detailed. So at the festival, I want to make sure that the listeners are clear. So talk about the, the venue and, and so forth of the performance spaces or is it outside? How is it set up? Oh, well, the, the festival takes place over a week and we use a lot of venues. It's not just in one place, a beautiful butterfly island, as they call it, of um, Guadalupe. They have two parts of it, you know, we have um, Grand Terre and Bastier, and we play at all of the venues there, at least a lot of the venues there, and we pre present it so like a traveling festival. Some of the concerts in the this hall or there, and some take place in the beautiful, what they call a cathedral, the um, the, the place of St. Peter and St. Paul. And uh, mm -hmm. that's what we do. And uh, the last thing that we did last year was it's quite extraordinary, is that we actually, our final concert mm -hmm. was broadcast through many of the French speaking countries um, in the world, like even Montreal. I got uh, messages from Montreal because they broadcast a classical music concert from Guadeloupe. Now, it might not sound interesting, but it was history was made because France is known for classical music and the arts and things like that. And they're always getting pumped into these islands, you know, music and videos and things like that from the mainland. For the first time in history, Guadalupe was pumping a, mute, a concert out. <laughs> it was like live from Guadalupe. It was, it was like, whoa, what just happened here? They were so proud and everybody tuned in and, you know, from the Cathedral of St. Peter, St. Paul, which holds like a thousand something people, you know, and it was, they were so proud. They did it like the Academy Awards. It was a red carpet, you know, the, and commentators, the whole nine yards. And people were contacting me, I said, as far as like Canada and France. And it was, it's really a big deal because never, it's like, really, they would expect that if something's coming from Guadeloupe, it's going to be some a Zouk concert or a jazz concert, but a classical music concert. Yeah, that was something very extraordinary. Wow, that, that is so amazing. Now, you know, during this time, not really just during this time, but really ongoing, there are some wonderful organizations that have really supported in particular artists of color. Could you maybe talk about some of the organizations that have been very instrumental in what you do? Well, first of all, I think you know, as these days, you know, people like me and artists in general, you need to be not only a scholar, but an educator, a promoter, and an entrepreneur. Yes. You, it's like, you know, if they're, you know, if you don't toot your own horn, there will be no band. 
<laughs> so true. Uh, and uh, you know, I got that one from Broadway legend Chapman Roberts. He told me that. And um, I think the most important thing about that, those aspects, is being an entrepreneur, um, especially if you're a person of color. We got to support other people of color. We have to do something that makes a difference. We have to do something um, that's needed. So I applaud, you know, these organizations, you know, what comes to mind, you know, you have Lee Kuntz at Gateways, uh, Chi Chi Nwanaku at, um, at the Chinerki in London, um, Stephanie Matthews, uh, String Candy, Burt Mason, Ovation Concerts, uh, Alpha and Aaron Dorkin of Sphinx, which everyone knows, and um, a big shout out, I would perhaps say to Fred O. Vokanesuke, or as they call him, Fred O. with the intercultural music. Yes, a pianist. Well, he's more than a pianist. He's a very great, he's a great choral conductor and educator. And he's been doing a lot. And, and uh, you know, he's done a lot for me personally, but a lot in St. Louis. And I don't think he gets the credit he deserves because he's been he at it. He does it. I think the first time I met him was at the Color of Music Festival. He's such a wonderful person. And I interviewed him years ago with Marlissa Hudson. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he, what he's doing is now it's exploding, you know, and he, you know, people like, you know, these organizations, they need support and they need, you know, support from the community and especially they need funding. You know, a lot of organizations and, uh, uh, for instance, I'm doing the Bayou Legend at uh, Opera Creo in New Orleans. We're, I'm doing it, William Grant still we're doing a, a pro, I don't know if it's a premiere, but I think it's a professional premiere of that opera. But these organizations, they need funds. You have all these big organizations giving money for to New York Phil and all these organizations. And I, you know, I, I shy away from saying white organizations to become more diverse. Mm -hmm. You have black organizations that are already diverse that could use a little bit of help. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I want to interject a question because a wonderful musician that I know through our mutual love of the, the great tenor Lawrence Brownlee, Gilchrist Sproul. And he has this question for you. He wants to know, Maestro, thanks for your hard work, your commitment and love for this mission. How accessible are scores for these works? Is there a critical edition in the works? Well, he has several questions here, so maybe you can answer the first part of that and I can go on. Okay. Right now, you know, all the works of St. George, most are in the library of National Bibliothèque in Paris and other places, even in Vienna, like the, some of the quartets are in Vienna. Um, with the festival and with the help of the regional, Conseil Regional, you know, the president, Ari Chalouz, and all these people in Guadeloupe, uh, they have part of the festival's back mission is to, and my mission is to make these scores available. I've been editing all the works of San George. It's taking me a while, but every year that the festival takes place, I have like, I don't know, about 10 works to put mm -hmm. in the catalog. I've been putting them in the computer with my team of people, and we've been making, editing them, correcting note mistakes. And, um, and that's how the whole, Anonymous Lover Opera came about making a new critical or new concert version of it. And I, sooner more than later, there's lots of talk about making a library in Guadalupe dedicated to San George in a small concert venue. And that's probably where we would start to collect all the memorabilia and all the scores and making them just accessible to the world. And people, mm -hmm. shout out, if, if I have something, count, call me. Uh, lots of people have, do you have this, Marlon? Or do you know where I can get it? And if I know or can help, I always send the music. You know what? And that's beautiful because I know you didn't ask for this point, but I'm going to put this out there. A lot of times people have resources like that and they keep it to themselves. But I think the more that you extend yourself and give, you would definitely get it back. So that's beautiful that you're like that. So you all heard that. If you all need to know more, reach right out to Marla. <laughs> yeah. well, now my box is going to be full. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> The, 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 I want to say the latter part of Gilchrist's question, he also asked, have you found other Afro-European composers from the same period of St. George? Okay, uh, of the same period, no. Um, St. George was really a, a cornerstone, which uh, everyone always thinks of the Austro-Hungarian Empire as being the, 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 you know, the seat of classicism, of the mm. classical period. Um, actually, at the time, uh, France was very active. If people wanted to make it even like Haydn, 
you know, St. George premiered the six Haydn symphonies. Um, so at, even at that time, he was an entrepreneur showing us the way. And, uh, but they, they, but composers afterwards, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Samuel Courage Taylor in London, and, you know, William Grant Still, and there's lots of composers that have come by and um, usually through a very, uh, a little bit of systematic racism, they always mm -hmm. compare these composers to like, you know, St. George, like the Black Mozart, Samuel Coolidge Taylor, the Black Mahler. And, you know, a friend of mine always told me that something of something is usually the nothing of nothing. So this is a way to downplay accomplishments. You know, because if you, you know, why is it, why would I want to, you know, listen to St. George when obviously Mozart is better because he's just the black one. Mm. You know, and so I think that that is very, you know, dangerous. These composers should be held like Schubert and Beethoven and St. George should be on their own for their own accomplishments. And if you follow the accomplishments of St. George, you will find a heck of a lot more than a lot of people of that period. So for me, St. George and France should really recognize this, that St. George should be hailed as really one of the fathers of the classical period. Wow, I wanna just uh, take a moment, we're not, we're not quite finished, but I just wanna uh, take a moment to say just thank you so much for just shining a light on Chevalier de St. George. I mean, I'll be honest, it was only maybe in the last five or six years that I, I myself even knew about him. So I want to thank you so much. And just as we wrap up our, our time together, we do have a wonderful question in the comments. Um, Lorraine wants to know, how can we attend these performances in Guadalupe? Oh, well, first of all, um, we're working on a new website. The old website is down where the new website should be up in about a few days. Um, and the festival is festivalsaintgeorge.com. Mm -hmm. or from people in France, festivalsaintgeorge.fr. And uh, we, the next festival is in April, and you can also go on the Guadalupe Tourism, and they will be selling packages and giving all this information, and especially on the website, because the association you know, that I run will be doing some special things for the festival and giving special packages. And April, and, um, you know, and now that we have JetBlue is going to be flying directly from New York City and other places directly to Guadalupe. So there is a way. Before, it was a little bit difficult to get to Guadalupe, but now it's super easy. And uh, once we the website's up, you can send messages to the website. We'll put you on a mailing list and things like that. And if you're you're, you're impatient, there's always MarlonDaniel.com. And you can read <laughs> it. Or Facebook. You know, And I will try to answer as many questions as best as I can. Now, I always ask a little question like this, maybe a Desert Island question, but this is a, a different question for you, Maestro. If you had the opportunity to put together your dream concert, your dream resources featuring the music of Chevalier de St. George, what would you do? You had all the resources available. Well. Well, first of all, I probably would do what I'm doing now, you know, offering a concert to orchestras in America, Europe, and all over with a concert that features uh, St. George and also features Mozart because I want people to hear how similar and yet how different, subtly different they are and their influence. So the concert that I'm offering right now to all the orchestras, a shout out to if anyone's listening to them, that's what I'm offering. I think that, you know, having a really great lineup of soloists for the opera, uh, The Anonymous Lover, will definitely help to bring it to light. Wow, well again, I just wanna say thank you so much for returning no. to the Maestro series. I just wanna, you know, again, say congratulations on your new appointment. And um, we're just all so excited and just thank you for, for helping us to, to get a, more of an understanding of who Chevalier de St. George is and we just, Truly want to support you and support the festival. Any last closing remarks to maybe someone who is a, a young aspiring conductor? What would you, if you had one piece of advice to give them, what would you say? Times are changing. Keep at it. Um, oh, wow. Keep at it. Well, Marla, it's been a joy. Thank you so much. And again, you. listeners, you have been listening and watching, hopefully, the Maestro series. Again, I'm your host, Patrick D. McCoy, 
And I thank you for joining me today. And I hope that you all have a wonderful day. And to the, oh, I have a big announcement. Uh, you may have seen it pop up on the screen. Before you all go, up next, I'm so pleased to announce the inaugural guest of the Maestra series, which is Renee Baker of the Chicago Modern Orchestra Project. I'm so excited. I've been following Maestra Baker for a while now, and it's time that we dedicate a dedicated uh, series to women conductors, women orchestral conductors. So I hope that you would tune in and more information forthcoming. Again, thank you all so much for joining.